Welcome to Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. That's DJ Shockley. I'm Dave Archer. Rack's not with us. Rack's out vacation with his family. Mm-hmm. So I hope he's having a good time. But Shock and I have you down for this week's uh, Falcons Audible here, presented by AT&T. And Shock, this is a tough one. We got yeah. to break down a, a game that was very meaningful for the team. Uh, it had a lot of impact on staying alive. Now, I'm going to do a dumb and dumber on you here. Uh-oh. There's, you're saying there's a chance. Yes, Atlanta, <laughs> the Atlanta is still alive, and we'll tell you about that. In fact, we'll talk about the Bears matchup. We'll also talk about what that playoff picture looks like. It's very simple. We'll break that down for you. And we'll look at some of the superlatives, some of the guys that are playing extremely well, it seems like, week in and week out, and some of the guys we need to maybe pick it up a little bit. But uh, big matchup this weekend. All right, initial thoughts, Bears, Falcons, cool <laughs> weather and the whole backdrop of what it's supposed to look like in Chicago so in December. Yeah. But the result was not where it was. What were your initial thoughts and and th- and about this game? Arch, right, so I look back and uh, obviously you think about that game and you say, man, this was a game that you felt pretty good going into, and you felt like this was a huge opportunity for this team to go on the road and do something they hadn't done a lot this year, which was win. Uh, I think you, we won two games on the road this season. But you go into an environment where, hey, like, like you've always talked about, it's going to be cold. It's going to be actually got some snow flurries. and But both teams have to play in that. And obviously that's just part of the, the plan. But I thought in this game, I thought there were some missed opportunities mm. in the game uh, from the Falcons' standpoint that would have gave them a bunch of opportunities in this game. Uh, obviously the interceptions are something that you, you, you just hate to have in the game. And whenever you lose that turnover battle, as we know, sometimes you, you're more than likely going to lose the football game. But I thought you had opportunities in this cha- in this game to kind of push the envelope forward. Um, there were a number of opportunities where you had guys running free in their secondary. Um, you, you had a bunch of chances where you could have gotten off the field a couple times. Um, but this just was a, a, a game ultimately where those opportunities really didn't afford you the chance to win the ball game late. Uh, I thought for for the most part uh, you ran the ball well. You averaged five point six yards of rush in the game. Uh, another game over a hundred yards rushing. Had one hundred and thirty four in the game. Uh, one of the keys I thought was Heineke being able to use his legs mm-hmm. in the game. Uh, he had a number of third down rushes or just opportunities where things weren't there down the field. And he took off the touchdown run to cut the lead. I thought was a a big time run by him uh, over twenty plus yards for that. Um, but this just was a, a, a game where I thought you had opportunities, especially at times on the defensive side, to get Justin Fields on the ground. And he made a couple of plays in the game that were kind theme, of backbreakers. Right? Reoccurring theme. Yeah, they, they were backbreakers. That, that that hurt you. And I remember one third down where, hey, it's third nine or something, and you got him corralled in the backfield. I think Bud Dupree has a shot on him. I think on Yamada has a shot on him. And he gets out of it and has a, you know, 13, 14-yard gain or whatever it is. So, I, I just look back on some of the situations of the game and uh, you, you just didn't uh, finish those moments as good as you as you thought you should. Shock, it seems like this has been something that we've talked about repeatedly. This team has been in position to make plays or plays are available there and they make some and some they don't make. And it seems like the ones they don't make, especially when you play in close football games, which this team has a great deal of the time. I think 33, their last 33 games, 23 have been one-score games. We've talked about that. Wow. And when you're in those kind of close games, it's magnified when you don't make make some of the plays. Okay, down 14 nothing. Yeah. Okay. And it happened. It seemed kind of like it happened quick. Atlanta doesn't take the football. They take the football. Don't really you get the you get the gadget play that get you on the first play of the game. Get you out over midfield. All of a sudden, you got wow. You got something going here, and you line up for another gadget play. And Bijan mishandles the snap. Maybe a little off to his left. Balls on the ground. And it seems like this offense has had a tough time. Shock overcoming negative plays within a three down sequence. Um, is there something that, that sticks out to you? And it's tough for any team. It's tough for any play caller when you when all of a sudden for, it's first and tw- it's second and twelve. Yeah. It's it's third and nine. Is there anything that sticks out to you as to yeah you know, how you overcome that? Or is there something we're not doing that we can overcome more of those? Or just let's let's stay out of those situations. Yeah. You know. I, I you know I, I still come in Arthur Smith for trying to be creative and. Of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. You look back and you say, "Man, you probably shouldn't have ran that play, or it didn't work, it didn't look good, or whatever the personnel was in." And I go back to some of the things I hear the players talk about every single week, and it's the details. And 
you go into these ball games, and these are plays that you've practiced probably five, six times throughout the week, and you have the play down. You have the details of it. You know the nuances of it, how things must go. And for whatever reason, the details of it, then you get in the game and you don't execute it. And it's hard to pinpoint it. Uh, obviously, we're not being able to sit in the meetings with these guys or, you know, be able to talk to coach about it in those scenarios. Um, but I don't fault Arthur Smith for calling these plays at times because he's trying to find the best play in those situations and he's trying to, you know, kind of break tendencies. Mm-hmm. If you, 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 look, you look back on a lot of games, you look back on a lot of situations and you say, man, they're so predictable at this. They're so predictable with that. Right. We hear fans say that all the time, and then you see something different happens, and it doesn't work, and you're mad about it. I understand that, but I love the creativity that Arthur Smith has always had within this uh, within this offense, and I think that was a scenario there where you know the guys just did not execute it. I, if it was a play that he saw happen like this three, four times in practice, he probably would have scratched it. He probably wouldn't have called it. <laughs> but uh, obviously, it was a play he felt good about at that moment at that time in the game, and they just didn't go out and execute. So it's, it, I think it's hard to uh, kind of fault uh, Arthur Smith for it or, or, or fault the, the situation because he's just trying to make, uh, I think, the best scenario for you. Well, what do you think it is? Because obviously you get to be around this team so much more. You talk to Arthur. You have a, uh, a, a keen sense. You talk to the quarterbacks every week. Uh, there, there has to be something that they talk about uh, after game or you know post game that says, all right, Things just didn't go our way, but what do you think is the reason? Well, first of all, you got to take with the good with the bad, right? Yeah. I mean, the first play of the game, you get the double reverse pass. You're thinking, "Wow, okay, yeah. that's cool." Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you look up and you're you're moving the football, and then all both quarterbacks are in the game, and so you kind of slide forward in your seat in anticipation that, "Well, here comes another one," and you get a little snap. So you're going to have some good plays with some bad plays, even when you go conventional offense and you run the football for no gain essentially or run the football into two yard loss or you have this play it seems like we we want as a fan to look at it and say why are you running a gadget play well we could have run it into the line and been a minus two yard play too (laughs) so we've had some of those and it's just been there has been a a little bit of an inconsistency with all 11 and i don't think it's necessarily a coaching scenario it's a focus scenario you know there's play calls and things that go into it they just have not been completely in sequence Mm. For an entire game, and, and frankly, most teams get out of sequence at some point during the game. But, Chuck, I want to take you back to 14 nothing. Atlanta gets the football back, and you go three-count screen. Yeah. And a guy that has been good, was good last year, broke the rookie rushing record in Tyler Algier. We don't talk as much about him as a pass receiver. He had the screen play against Carolina last year in, like, week seven or eight, took 20, 25 yards for a touchdown. Well, this one he took a lot further than that. Tell me about the play and the way it unfolded because there was some pretty cool stuff that happened on the play that gave him the opportunity. Whoops, sorry. Gave up the gave the opportunity for Tyler to go the distance. Yeah, you look back on that play and you say, man, first it obviously starts with, with Taylor. He does a, such a good job of having to change his arm angle just to get that football out. And you think about sometimes in screens where, you know, linemen let the D-line come up and they're immediately in your face. And you have to kind of navigate the traffic of a guy in your face and you got to get that football out. So he does a good job of getting the ball out. And then I think for a really good screen, you have to have athletic linemen who can get out in space and block. And I thought Lindstrom did such a great job of running his guy by, swiping him by, then getting out right now, getting on the DB, and it was such a good design. And then you look down the field, you got receivers blocking on the, on the back end. Tyler does a good job of setting up the blocks and then using speed to go 75 yards. You don't see two happen, run away from a defense, but it was a perfect call. I love the call on first down. Uh, their defense is excited. They want to get upfield. They want to rush the passer, and you drop that football off, and, you know, you got guys out in front, uh, you know, kind of being a caravan for Tyler Iger, which was a really cool play. Like you mentioned, it's 14 nothing right now. You need a big-time drive, and you go back and boom, one play, you're right back in. It's 14-7. Now you feel good about the West, of what, the way this game could go. Uh, but I, I love the call from Arthur Smith. I love – uh, the execution part of it, because there are a lot of things that could have happened. A guy could not have got his block or not gotten out, or Lindstrom could have, you know, whiffed on his guy. He did a good job of, of staying kind of square on that defensive back, and then obviously DBs blocking down the field. You had receivers running their vertical routes and then coming back to block. So every guy had to do their particular job on that particular play to get that thing back to seven points. Yeah, we talk about, you know, clutch 
moments, clutch plays and clutch moments, and you talked to us through that perfectly. Algiers' ability to step up and slow pay the th- three-count screen. And why did, why is it called three-count screen? Because in the old days, 1,001, 1,002, 1,000, and you Get release out. out okay. <laughs> And so you're looking to make it look like drop back, and everybody's got to be on the same page. Quarterback makes it look like drop back, and then he starts to lose ground. And Shock said, i got to find an angle to get the football to the back. Um, Algier steps in there like he's part of the protection. He can't release too soon because if it's man coverage or even if it's a zone and the linebacker sees it, he's going to break on it. Linemen have to be timed up perfectly. If they release too soon, man, here come people downhill trying to make the play. So the execution there was phenomenal. So – as much as we say, okay, there's some moments where we don't execute, that one was one of those plays where it was executed perfectly. Talk about Lindstrom downfield, Scotty Miller down the field, and you have a 75-yard touchdown. By the way, how long in this league are you going to underestimate how fast Chatter Algier can I know, run? right? Crazy. I mean, he looks like he's a banger <laughs> between the tackles, but if you get him on the edge, he did it last week too on that little toss play where he got in the end zone. I want to ask you about the backs, and the backs have been kind of the featured part of this offense. Drake London's been solid. A few moments from Kyle here and there, but the two backs have been predominantly the guys, right? Yeah. Bijan Robinson touched the football uh, yesterday, I, or, I'm sorry, on Sunday, um, what, 18 times. 18 mm-hmm. times for 86 yards. Algier touched it just six times for 88 yards, but 75 came on one play. Is that a con- is that one of those scenarios, Shock, for you where you're riding the hot hand? Bijan seemed to have a little bit of a flow running the football where we've seen Algier in those positions before. Yeah, no doubt. It's, it's interesting you say that because I think every game has been different. And there's been games where it, it feels like Bijan's been balled up. It feels like games Tyler's been, you know, not really as effective. But I thought in this game you found ways to get Bijan the football in space. And he ran the football really well. Give the guys up front some credit, too. There were some holes – uh, up front, and this was against a defense that was really, you know, was pretty good against the run coming in. So you talk about being able to run the football and have those two guys have uh, a kind of productive game is always good. And whenever a guy has that kind of, like you say, hot hand, you got to try to keep feeding him. And I think the Falcons have done such a good job of trying to create ways for those guys to get the football. I remember there was games where, you know, Tyler is the feature guy in the ball game. And people think, oh, you draft Bijan, and he should be the guy that's touching the football every time. Well, we heard early, we heard probably midway through the year, Arthur Smith talked about, hey, maybe we use Bijan a little too much and put too much on his plate. And then you remember, hey, I do got a thousand yard back here in Tyler Algier who can make a lot of guys miss, who can make some a lot of things happen for him. So I love the combination. I love the fact that you go into a ball game not knowing who will probably be the hot hand, but you continue to feed him, and it only bodes well for the quarterback, bodes well for this offense. And I think both those guys have done a good job this year of understanding what their role is in a particular game because it changes every single week of who's going to be the guy that has the 10 to 15 carries or who's the guy who's going to catch the football out of the backfield or there's been times where both of them have been in the game. So I love uh, the usage of both those guys. I think they're both ultra-talented and uh, fit what Arthur Smith likes to do really well, which is be downhill physical backs but also have the ability to, to, to hurt you in the pass game. Okay, some superlatives from this game, and I know the win was the number one concern. It always is when you get in a game. We didn't get that done. But Tyler Algier, I mentioned what he had. He had the 75-yard touchdown. It's the longest play of his career. Uh, and it's the longest play from scrimmage this season for the Falcons. In fact, it's the longest play from scrimmage since the 75-yard touchdown pass by Demir Bird a oh. year ago oh, in wow. Cincinnati. So a big-time nice. play. But John Robinson, 86 yards from scrimmage. He ties William Andrews' record set in 1979 for a rookie. Wow. 1,332 yards in 16 games. And so – that's where it's going to end for me. I played with William <laughs> Andrews. We have you another game. You don't get the other game? going to get – Bijan's going to break the record. Uh, but it's a 16-game record, and I'm going to, I'm going to protect so you're William. You're going to pull a little asterisk by I'm going, to, I'm going to put William – I'm going to protect <laughs> William Andrews here. That's a – that's a big, but an unbelievable performance by a guy taken that had unbelievably high expectations. You're talking about a guy now that's on the verge of 1,000 yards. He's got 948 yards rushing. He's got 51 receptions on the year. He's got seven touchdowns, which eclipses what William Andrews did that year. William had five touchdowns. Bijan's got seven touchdowns. Let me ask you this. With with, with saying just – I'm thinking about those numbers, and you come into the season and everybody, you know, was enamored with what Bijan Robinson can do how would he fit in his offense? 
with the numbers you just mentioned, would you say that was a successful season without knowing anything else? You say, okay, these are the numbers heading into the last week of the season. Would you say this was a productive and what you thought would be for a B. John Robinson in this offense? Productive, absolutely. Um, I think, unfortunately, our head is a little bit clouded because we're equating – wins we yeah. want wins and so we're we're shy in that category and i i would concur with the fan and that we're in this game to win games For numbers sure. are nice and you can sprinkle all the numbers you want to but ultimately you got to win football games but if you just singled out his performance as a rookie um yeah you're talking yeah. about a, a record that stood since 1979 <laughs> in this franchise yeah. think about how many really good rookies have come through this organization and Bijan robinson to be standing there tied for the all-time record. Also, Drake London breaks the record that Julio Jones set. Pretty good player back in the pretty, day, Julio Jones. Not too far player. back in the day, but most receptions in a two-year span by a player. He has 137 receptions. Julio set that record with 133 receptions. And Jesse Bates, 11 tackles oh this goodness. weekend. He now, he now has six games with double-digit tackles. If I told you Jesse Bates and what he's going to bring to the table, were you thinking – I think you were thinking takeaways, which yeah. I was too, and he's done that. Yeah. Were you thinking 120 plus tackles for this guy? No, I I, I would not have guessed that. I, I'll be honest. I I knew Jesse Bates was a really good player. Obviously, over the last few years, Cincinnati was a team that was in the playoffs. They were always, you know, you you seen them playing a lot on TV, so you knew who Jesse Bates was. But I would never have understood the impact that he would have made this season with the numbers, the interceptions, the way he's all over the field, just the way he commands himself in the locker room. like I, Those are things that I didn't know all the way about Jesse Bates. And, you know, you start the season with those couple picks versus Bryce Young. You're like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, he got it versus a, a rookie. You know, he threw it right to him, and those are good plays. But as the season progressed, this was who Jesse was. Mm. This is who Jesse is, and we've seen him all year long. And I think anybody who turns on the tape, who watches – uh, the Falcons' defense play this year, you say, man, number three is all over the field. You see him in the high hole. You see him down below. You see him blitzing. You see him covering guys. This dude's been everywhere and done everything for this defense. Has been the the ideal player you needed for your secondary coming into this season and definitely was a, a extreme high point. I think whatever, you know, uh, the, the Falcons paid him to come here was well worth it. And uh, I'm glad that this guy will be around for, for years to come. And the fact that he has been such a tremendous value for this team on the defense side of the ball has been fun to watch this year. And this, if this dude's not all pro, uh, I, I don't know what all pro looks like. Yeah, I would agree with you. Another nine tackles for Cade Nellis uh, on Sunday, a sack. That's his fourth sack on the year. And how about Zach Harrison? The rookie seems to get better as the season's gone along. We talked about three sacks in his last two games going into the Chicago game. He had a career high four tackles for the rookie from Ohio State, and I guess he had a lot of fun getting after his former teammate <laughs> in, in, in Justin Fields, but he, maybe not enough. Uh, we didn't get him enough on the ground. Let's look forward now, Shock. Okay, I, we talked about playoff picture, and, and, and the fans probably aren't wanting to hear all oh, this, that, and the other, but it's real. This is a Tampa team that stumbled this weekend against New Orleans. That's who Atlanta's got this weekend in New Orleans. Um, that was a New Orleans team that went to Tampa and beat the Tampa Bay Bucks. Tampa's now got to go to Carolina, a team they beat eight, uh, 21 to 18 just three weeks ago in Tampa. Very close football game. It was close late. Tampa scored with about five minutes left in the game. A very close game down the stretch. Tampa held on to win the football game. So don't think that even though Carolina got shut out last week and all that kind of stuff, styles make fights, and they fought pretty well against this Tampa team last time. And now – the key is Atlanta's got to go take their business. But very clear cut, Tampa must lose to Carolina. Atlanta must go to the hated Saints mm, and win. Sure. Mindset for you as a player, knowing that that's kind of in the offing, can't really be looking over here at what's on this screen. you got to take care of your own business. Which is hard, which is hard because obviously, you know, your fate depends upon somebody else. And I think for the past, past few weeks, you've understood that you need other things around you to happen. But also – you got to take care of your own business because you think about this past week, you know, the, the, the loss hurts you because, hey, it takes all the wild card scenarios out of it in case, you know, uh, Tampa does go on a win and all this kind of stuff. But I think going into this week, ultimately, if you do not take care of your own business, nothing else matters. Because if you go into this ball game and you're so concerned with what's going on down in Carolina and you don't execute what you're supposed to do in New Orleans – 
Well, guess what? It won't matter because if you if you lose, then at the end of the day, they go down and lose. It won't matter because then New Orleans takes it. Because it's it's one of those scenarios as a player, uh, which every game you should have the same mindset is you got to take care of what's in front of you, the here and now, because ultimately you can't control what goes on anywhere else. And that's one thing that I know you know it, Arch. It's always been ingrained in my head. Uh, you got to take care of the here and now. You got to make sure you're taking care of the business that's in front of you right now because if not, then guess what? Nothing else matters going forward. So the mindset is, is simple. Go do your job, win your one-on-ones, and then also you got to make sure your team is ready to go because there's no tomorrow. There's no second chances. This is week 17. This is what you want. You come into the year saying, hey, if you got a chance to go to the playoffs, you win your last ball game, would you take it? You say, absolutely. So – Go handle your business in New Orleans uh, because you don't want you don't want the double edge of you lose the ball game and Tampa loses and the team that you hate the most walks into the <laughs> playoffs right. when that's you right. have the opportunity. So yeah. that's absolutely what you do not want. So I think, yeah, you're going to take a, a, a peak human nature to see what's going on down there because that has a big feel. But ultimately – you got to do what you got to do and take care of your business first. All right, well, let's look at some of the specifics. Saints-Falcons in New Orleans Sunday, 1 o'clock kick. This was a game that Atlanta won just a few weeks ago. A 24-15, Atlanta won the football game. Remember, Jesse Bates got it all started. Bates had an interception deep in Falcon territory, returned, returned it some 90 yards for a touchdown, kind of kick-started Atlanta. Atlanta ran for 220-plus yards in yeah. the game. Bijan Robinson, you got Tyler Algier going. Um, now, the turnover scenario was 2-2. Two and two. Yep. Um, there was a couple of turnovers for the Falcons, a couple of turnovers for the Saints in the game. So as you kind of digest what just happened to Atlanta, and I, I'm bringing up what just happened, DJ Moore, and then I'm going to equate that to, remember, Chris Olave got off to a really good start Seven in this for game. for 114, yeah. Yeah, and then got hurt. Remember, he got slammed on the sideline by A.J. Terrell. Mm. Atlanta had sw- – A.J. wasn't me- sh- uh, shadowing uh, Olave early on. And they switched him over on him. And then big tackle along the side, and Olave hit his head and was out of the game. Big loss for them in that football game. But knowing what D.J. Moore just did and how they schemed Atlanta up, Chris Olave and what he did early on in this game, how much are we going to see that copycat thing out of this thing? Oh, no doubt. I, I think you'll see tons of it. When I was watching this ball game, I thought Chicago tried to – Try to with their game plan with their with where they had him lined up. They got him on our safeties a lot in the ball game, and uh, you know it's not ideal. We have your number one receiver on you know our safeties, which you know still a good cover guys. But in those moments, uh, those are the plays that were big in the ball game. And like you mentioned, Olave was having a big time ball game already before he was getting taken out. Uh, DJ Moore is a big time player. He's gonna come in and have that same kind of mindset. They're gonna look at hey. Bears found X, Y, and Z to get their guy free. Uh, but I think ultimately it comes down to what happened on the other side of the ball for us in that ball game. Uh, I thought the Saints were remember, Saints were 0-5 in the red zone in that ball game. Um, you gave up zero sacks in that ball game uh, to the Saints. Protecting your quarterback was big. Uh, Bijan went 16 for 91 in the game. Drake had five catches for 91 yards in the game. And you mentioned it, 228 yards rushing the football uh, the Falcons are really good on third down against the Saints. Saints were only 6 of 14 in the ball game. So you're talking about some things that you did really well in that ball game that you can go back and look at the tape and say, okay, what were some of the things that were very successful for us? And obviously that was, you know, a few weeks back. There are going to be a different wrinkles coming into this ball game. But I think ultimately that's what it comes down to. You can protect your quarterback and you can limit their explosive plays, which that's what they want to do. We know Derek Carr is a guy who's throwing the football over the yard. I went back and looked at his last three ball games, eight touchdowns to only one interception. He wow. completed 75% of his passes versus the Bucks with two tubs and zero interceptions. So he's going to come in feeling good about himself. He understands at home uh, it's a different animal. We both played and been in New Orleans plenty of times, you know what that environment's like. And they know exactly what's on the line too. They're speaking the same thing in their building that we're speaking here in Flowery Branch that we got to give ourselves a chance – to go to the next level in the postseason, so we need our best ball game. So it, it will be a battle of possessions, I think, in this ball game. I think every possession will be critical. Um, the plays you make that are there, that you have to make, I think will be crucial. Um, you can't have the missed opportunities. And I, I go back to the Chicago game. Uh, yeah, the weather was a big factor, but, you know, we left some points on the board. We missed a couple field goals. 
Uh, we, we left a couple sacks on the board. I mean, there were a couple small things in the ball game that led to us not ultimately coming out with the W. So I think you got to go to New Orleans and you got to make sure every possession counts, protect your quarterback, and do what you've been doing, which is run the football versus this unit and force those guys like Tyron Matthew to come up and tackle you. Yeah, listen, it's not lost on Shock and I. I. We know what you're thinking out there. We've been inconsistent at the quarterback position. I think that's the best way I can say it and the For nicest sure. way I can say it. For sure. Three interceptions this weekend, you're not going to win a lot of games when you throw the ball to the other team three times. Now, whatever the circumstances are for the ball in and up there, I'm responsible as quarterbacks. We throw it wherever it ends up. We're responsible for it. Can't win that way. Got to have better consistency at the quarterback position. Got to take care of the football Turnovers have to be minimized. We talked about there were two and two in this game last time. Atlanta had the big one, the pick six by Jesse Bates. Can't have anything like that happen. And then you've got to, as Shock said, make the plays that are there. There was a play in the game this weekend against Chicago where Atlanta play action fakes. You got two front side routes, and you got Scotty Miller that works across the formation and works down the sideline. Mm. He's wide open, yeah. and we missed him uh, for whatever reason. Guy in your face, whatever it is, you make that throw. It's a walk in touchdown. Can't miss those in this game if you want to win this football game. Um, Shock, a couple of – you just talked through kind of the way this game needs to go. Um, I think we just talked through kind of the keys there as far as turnovers is always one of those scenarios. Win the moments, third down, red zone moments. Mm. Um, from a defensive perspective, how do you regroup? i, want, I got a couple of questions for you. Defensive perspective, this was not the best game defensively. Lost guys in coverage. There were a number of moments where you didn't get the quarterback on the ground. You said, how do you reboot the system here, and, and what are you looking for from a group that's got a lot of veterans on that side of the ball? Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting because I think this ball game is a little different from what, what, what you just came from. And for the majority of the season, this has been a defense that has been really good. You've been able to – you've been a top 15 – uh, ranked defense for the majority of this year, and you've played some really good football. Uh, I, I think in this ball game, it comes down to what we just talked about, limiting some of those big time plays. That's something that you you haven't you, you've given up from time to time, yeah, because teams are going to make their plays, but not as many as you did in the run and pass game. And I think that ultimately was a big part of how they were able to have sex. Be, I mean, have, have have success was because of how they came off the ball and was running the football against us. Uh, I know Khalil Herbert had a couple big runs in the ball game, especially late in the ball game. And then you, you mentioned DJ Moore, the kind of things that he were doing. For me, for this defense, it goes back to what have we done all year long to be able to have success. And I think that's being able to disguise pre-snap, give some look of something different, and then pro-snap, you do something totally different. I, I think you've done a good job of mixing up your pressures, mixing up man and zone, uh, mixing up uh, – if, if you're one of those guys, A.J. Terrell, say, hey, their top receiver I want to go get, let's go get it. I've seen A.J. be that guy before and say, let's let, let's force those issues. And I think the other part of it is when this defense has really got after you is when they've created turnovers. They've forced the issue and forced the other quarterback into uncomfortable situations. I remember uh, the, the Indianapolis Coast game where you, you harassed Minshew. You got him off his spot tons of times. You did that versus Justin Fields. He just was athletic enough at times to make plays and get out of it. But I think in those games where you're able to affect the quarterback, that's when his defense has been at his best and you're in guys' hip pocket. You're playing – confident on the back end. So I think there's, uh, I mean, you, you look back at Kay Nellis, you, you look back at what Nate Lamb has done this year, two guys that have absolutely flourished in this defense this year. You thought when Troy Anderson went down, hey, that's a big loss. Yeah, he's a big loss, but Nate Lamb has stepped in and looks like he could possibly be a pro bowler with the way he's played this year. Kay Nellis, there were times I, you saw him run down Justin Fields yeah. a couple times in this ball game. Those two guys have played a tremendous role in this game. And you can't allow a guy like Alvin Kamara to be the guy that beats you. We know Taysom Hill is another guy who we've seen over the years has had three or four plays in a game right. that you say, all right, those were uh, big defining plays that gave them an edge. You can't allow Taysom Hill to have those kind of plays in a ball game as well as have Derek Carr have a good game as well. So you got to force their playmakers to be – uh, kind of null and void, and you can't have all those guys hitting on all cylinders. So defensively, lock in on those keys, man, and make sure that you're in the, the, the position you're supposed to be. From a quarterback perspective, I, I can tell you, throw through three in a game before, not not proud of that, but you you got to bounce back, and so you got a short memory. 
put the tape on, learn what you can. Are there moments when I could have dropped the ball off instead of throw the ball late? A couple of the interceptions were late throws down the field. That usually doesn't work out unless you're out of the pocket somewhere and you're buying time. So learn from those moments and flush that out of your system and be better for your team because your team's counting on you and you know that. So you, you flush that out and you get ready for this one. Hey, it's Saints week. Taylor Heineke quoted is saying, we know where we are right now. We're going to focus on the Saints, go out and beat them, and we're going to root like hell for the Panthers. <laughs> That's about all you can do. It's Saints week, uh, baby, and yeah. I, everything kind of gets flushed out of yeah. your mind at that point, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Arch, one last thing I got to ask for you, man. If you're a guy who's played in this series tons of time and how impactful it can be, does going to New Orleans and the emotion of that ball game have any effect on you as a quarterback being – the same aggressive players you want to after what just happened this past week. Now we know Taylor has a you know has a has a has an ankle and all this kind of stuff, and you know it's all up in the air about who plays and all this kind of stuff. But regardless, whoever is playing quarterback, this environment is different. Yeah, and it's week seventeen. You got everything on the line, and it kind of goes back to the scenario we talked about when Taylor took over after you know the second time when when Dez you know was was put down, and you said okay. If I'm walking into this game, the number one thing that I do not want to do is turn the football over. Now you go into week 17, everything's on the line, and how do you combat, okay, I still got to be aggressive and make plays for my team, but I also do not want to hurt my team because this is win or go home pretty much. How do you manage that emotion as well as playing in the game to help your team be the best it can be from your standpoint playing that position? Well, you know as well as I do, you cannot go into a game with negative mindset. I can't do this. I can't do that. I've got to flush whatever I got last week out of my system. Learn from what you did. And I I can tell you it's a fairly easy learning process. Two of the interceptions are late throws. He just late throws it down the field when I need to check the ball down or go get something myself. And he did that a number of times, made the right decision. He made the wrong decision a couple times and forced it into coverage. Learn from those moments and get ready for the next opportunity. But you got to go into the positive mindset because that will make you hit the brake a little yeah. bit on a throw inside if I'm not willing. Trust your eyes. We talked about this before here on Falcons Audible um, where – You've got to be able to trust your eyes, turn it loose on time. If you're late, drop it off. Let's work from that perspective, and I think you'll have the right mindset. Uh, For Saints Week, right, that's right. Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Like, subscribe, or review at Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, or YouTube. Appreciate you being with us. We'll talk at you again next week, but it's Saints Week. Let's give me some. Let's go.